Um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dave Lasky from Seattle. He's going to be doing. He's going to. He's got a slideshow that he's prepared on the history of many comics. So I'll hand the microphone over to you, and we'll get this moved aside. And you're in the audience. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Is, is it Hussey or Hussein? Do you get that a lot? I'd like to thank Frank for inviting me here today. I'm going to do a talk called The History of Mini Comics. And this was Frank's idea. Um, <laughs> And he asked me would I want to do a history of mini comics talk, and I said, "Yeah, sure," because I know all about mini comics. And then, when I thought about it, I thought, "Well, I know about mini comics from about 1990 on, because that's when I started doing them." But I don't really know anything about before 1990, so I had to do some research. And it, the more I, the deeper I dug into it, the more it turned out. It's really kind of an impossible task to do a history of mini comics because there's no set time when they anyone knows that they started and and there's so many of them you can't really document them all very easily. So I'm gonna do kind of a my history of mini comics and it's really gonna be just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I've got some notes here that'll help me out. First off, what is a mini-comic? Does everyone here have a pretty good idea? <laughs> I think everyone in the audience is a cartoonist today, pretty much. Um, it's a handmade comic. It's usually photocopied and self-distributed. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. A podium like professors have, with a little tiny one. Um, thank you. Uh, and they're photocopied usually, sometimes they're offset printed and self distributed or distributed by the post office. It's not necessarily a small comic, but they usually are smaller than the commercially printed comics. Um, So my lecture is going to focus on mainly North American mini comics, mostly American, because that's what I know, and uh, mostly from the last 30 years. I'm going to look at a few key creators, and I'm going to exhibit some amazing specimens of the medium. But like I say, this is not a complete history. It's pretty impossible to do a complete history. For example, I realized last night I have no examples of Matt Fiesel or Colin Upton who have done tons of mini comics and are a huge influence on a lot of people, so I apologize for that. But just see this as a, a, a sort of introduction to the history of mini comics. Uh, maybe I can get, work this into an evergreen course at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Consider this like the first lecture class. Uh, since your introduction. So who made the first mini-comic? I asked Bruce Chrislip, who's kind of an expert, who should actually be here today doing this, except he lives in Ohio now. But I asked Bruce, and he says it was by Justin Green, and it was called Spare Comic from about 1972. But then I talked to Jim Woodring, and he said, no, Spare Comic was just one of many coming out at the time. And uh, so I asked Michael Dowers, who's also kind of an expert, and he said, you know, it's really kind of a controversial subject, and he wasn't even going to touch that. <laughs> and if you think about it, um, the, uh, well, there have been people self-publishing little books of words and pictures for a long time. Somebody in Seattle, uh, when I brought up the question, said, well, William Blake, first uh, <laughs> comics. 
and yeah, I guess that's true. And and I would throw in Beatrix Potter, who self-published great little books of words and pictures, and she really liked the small size because it was good for kids. Uh, and of course, uh, we've all probably seen uh, examples of Tijuana Bibles, which are really the first mini comics and the first underground comics. Um, and it's so crazy that they're not from Tijuana and they're not Bibles. <laughs> and they were apparently made by the Mafia. <laughs> They're, they're very mysterious, and I'm glad they exist in our world. <laughs> um, they, were, they were little pornographic comic books. Uh, and then there were chick tracks that started in the 60s, I guess. Um, though I don't know a lot about those. So there's been kind of a, a long, ongoing development. But, you know, things really exploded in about 1973, because that was when the underground comics died um, for a variety of reasons I won't go into. Uh, but there were all these underground artists and artists who read underground comics who were then influenced to do their own comics who suddenly had no outlet for their work because all these uh, head shops were afraid to carry comics are being shut down because of underground comics. So, people took the publishing and distributing into their own hands and created little mini-comics. Um, another factor is that the Xerox machine, with the photocopier, was introduced and, and has been making great improvements over the last 30 years. where you don't need a, a, an offset press or a publisher, you can just go down to a local shop and make your comic in a half hour or whatever, depending on how elaborate you get. Uh, so, in the end, uh, it doesn't really matter who is first. What matters is that people started doing it. Uh, now, on the screen here, you're probably You've probably never seen this before, and I never had <laughs> until a few days ago. This is a mini-comic from uh, 1972. It's credited to a T. Mancusi. It's eight pages long, and it sold for seven cents, um, less than a penny a page. And this is an example of a really early mini-comic from what we traditionally think of as mini comics. Uh, this is what the first ones were like, and they were about the quarter quarter size of a legal sheet of paper. Uh, they were about eight pages. And uh, now we're going to move on. I have a special system worked out with a guy named David up there, where I say, well, I didn't even have to say it, I'm gonna say next slide, please, and he changes the slide. <laughs> We devised it beforehand. <laughs> what we have up here is a, it's the beginning of the new wave, the new wave movement. Um, these are examples of some early mini comics from the 70s and early 80s. Um, it's called the new wave, I guess, after New Wave Music, a lot of people didn't like that term, but it eventually stuck, and it was a wave, because there were a lot of people all of a sudden seeing mini-comics and saying, hey, I can do that, and doing it. And as a result, there were, there, there's been just lots of really bad mini-comics made. <laughs> <laughs> but also some really amazing ones. And, uh, what we have up here, on the left, you see Yikes um, and Instant Comics and Drawings. These are by George Erling, who began doing these in 1975. The white ones are basically just a sheet of paper folded in half, and that's all they are. Then he gets more, uh, I think the color cover is from about 1980. It gets more complex. Um, 
the Robot Fields is by Larry Weir. It's from 1977. You can see it's got a real heavy metal kind of influence to it. Um, there was a, I guess in the early 80s, there was kind of a branch of mini comics that was all like people doing superhero and fantasy work, but as minis. Um, and then Vampire Beaver is right next to me. It's uh, from 1983. It's by Dave Geary and Joe Hall. And these are all, by the way, from the collection of Michael Dowers. And he said Vampire Beavers is one of his favorite comics, and nobody knows about it. So he wanted to make sure I got it in the show today. And it's pretty funny. It's like an Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, but with beavers, who are vampires. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, on the left, um, we see a mini called Outside In, uh, which was a, a mini comic of self-portraits by mini comic artists. That's all it was, and it ran for many issues. Um, the cover and the self-portrait are both by Clay Geerties. He's a major, major figure in mini comics. He uh, he was like a 60s pop culture review guy, working for newspapers like the East Village Other and you know alternative papers of the time. And he met a guy named Greg Irons, who was an underground cartoonist, who spent an afternoon telling Clay all about this cool stuff going on in comics. And from that moment, Clay became like the comics review guy. And wrote about comics for different papers, Berkeley Barb and whatnot. And if people made an underground comic or a mini comic, they had to get Clay to review it because then they knew people would come looking for it. Um, he started publishing a review zine, a uh, newsletter actually in 1973. It was called Comics World. Um, and later started a publishing label called Comics World. He, in this newsletter, really popularized the term New Wave. Uh, the New Wave movement went on from about 1975 to 85, and Clay Geerties was like a guru, from what I can tell, of this movement. Um, in the center we see Air Pirates Special Pirate Edition. Air Pirates was actually an underground comic of the early 70s that was sued by Disney for using Mickey Mouse by uh, Dan O'Neill, I believe. And uh, this, this pirate edition was made by Michael Dowers of Starhead Comics, and it is a pirate of an illegal underground comic. So it's really kind of a unique thing, and uh, it just shows that many comics were even further under the radar than undergrounds, because uh, Disney doesn't know about this, apparently. Uh, Michael said it sold out immediately. People love it. Uh, and then this last comic right above my head is called Dada Gumbo um, from 1985. It's by a guy named Dale Luciano who wrote a series for the Comics Journal in 1985 called New Wave Comics Survey. It ran from issue 96 to 102, and it is an incredibly detailed description of New Wave Comics with endless profiles of artists from the movement, some of whom are now really famous, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle guys, um, Gary Panter, a lot of people I can't remember who were are, who are all doing mini-comics at the time. And there are also a lot of obscure artists who I've never heard of. Um, it's just an incredible document and it's really cool that the Comics Journal did something like that. At the same time, Steve Willis uh, believes that being written up so extensively in the journal also killed the New Wave Comics movement. Um, but many comics kept going. Um, it's really, uh, it seems like uh, something that can't be stopped. Uh, a lot of the New Wave artists
have gone on to other things, but mini comics just doesn't die. It's it's an amazing. We'll we'll talk more about that later. Next slide, please. Um, these are two pages from Clay Geordie's mini comic called Baby Fat, number nine. So this is from 1979, and uh, we have Jim Sergi art and uh, Brad Foster art. And what they were doing, Clay would send them newspaper items, and they would make a little gag cartoon out of the item. Um, and this was a, kind of a little anthology. There were a lot of little anthologies in the late 70s. Brad Foster was a, uh, a very prolific mini-comic artist who influenced a lot of people, and he's in the next slide. Next slide, please. These are all uh, Brad Foster comics. This large one is called The Collected Tales of the Gig Gangs from 1975. I think it was one of his very first comics. And then he went on to do mini-sized comics like this. He's done hundreds as far as I know. Extremely prolific. Um, nowadays makes pinup art like you see in this last comic here. Um, but did a lot of humor art, um, influenced a lot of people back in the late 70s and 80s. Next slide, please. These two comics were made by Everyman Studios in 1980. They're also mini-anthologies. Pep Comics and Space Junk. Um, Everyman Studios was seven artists in, from Colorado, uh, one of whom was Artie Romero, who has a website it's arty.com, A-R-T-I-E, uh, and has a lot of the history of his, his uh, minis and a magazine he made, which we will look at in a second. Um, on the website, he talks about how these were color covers published on an offset press that was so small, it was a tabletop offset press. Um, it's really... These are, in reality, they're really tiny little comics. It's really impressive what they did. The elaborate uh, means they went through to make these. Uh, and they were probably print runs of only about 100 copies. Next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> the wit and humor of... Uh, this is from 1981. It's an anthology of one page. Uh, gag comics with actual quotes from Richard Nixon. And the, the only credit in the book is copyright Dick Nix. <laughs> I guess that was their way of getting around copyright infringement. Um, Riffs is by Bruce Chrislip from 1981. It's in Everyman Studios with the color cover. Um, in both of these you can see that uh, the underground comics influence was still quite evident in the New Wave movement. Uh, next slide, please. And these are two magazines uh, made by Artie Romero. Or there are two issues of a magazine called Cascade Comics Monthly. I took these, these are actually screen captures from the web, so they're kind of fuzzy. But they're not bad. Um, this was a review zine, and something Bruce Chrislip pointed out to me, which is really true, is that many comics depend on some sort of review zine, uh, some kind of trading post where people can exchange addresses, and uh, Cascade was just one of many, and it was a really nicely produced one. The cover uh, with The Man with the Gun is actually by Art Spiegelman, who did an interview for that issue, talking about his upcoming project called Mouse. <laughs> Next slide, please. These are more uh, review zines. On the left, we see City Limits Gazette, which Bruce Chrislip started, uh, started in 1978 as a comic this one in front with the science fiction cover 
was the All Comics first issue, and a few years later, about 1981, it became a review zine. The first issue's cover is by, I believe, Joe Zabel, who now draws some pretty cool mystery comics. Um, he's been, he's a long time mini comics guy. On the right, we see Destroy All Comics, which is from the 90s. It's, uh, it was early 90s, made by Jeff Levine. This kind of blurry photo on the cover of this one is a, a picture of Jeff himself. He has electrodes attached to his head because he took a job as a human guinea pig so he could make enough money to Xerox the issue. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're going to look at Steve Willis. Steve is a major, major figure of the New Wave era. Um, he's uh, largely associated with Morty the Dog, who we see on the right here. Uh, I talked to mostly Bruce Chrislip and Michael Dowers for research on the 80s mini comics, and they both said Steve Willis was far and away the leading guy in early 80s mini comics. Like, nobody could touch this guy. He was really funny, really prolific, uh, made some incredible comics, and um, they're mostly out of print now. I'd really like to see some of those. Um, these are two uh, comics Michael Dowers published under Starhead. They're actually uh, fancier versions of comics that uh, Willis had done originally in black and white. Storm Warnings is originally from 1986, and this is a 1990 reprint. If I start to go on too long, somebody tell me to speed it up. Uh, next slide, please. This is just uh, some of Steve Willis's work. These are all by him. Uh, just to show you, he was prolific. Um, as I recall, the 60s is all just kind of portraits uh, drawn like that Abe Lincoln and, and uh, text with the portraits. And then something like Morty the Dog is cartoonier, wackier. This red one here is Morty the Dog, number nothing. And Michael Dowers told me there are only about 10 known copies of that book, so he wanted me to be sure and include it. Um, he kept handing me mini-comics saying, this one's really rare, there's only like three known to exist. Like, uh, I shouldn't take that. No, 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 take it. So I, for posterity, I, I photographed a lot of rare comics. Now you see the Sasquatch comics have a definite Northwest feel, because Steve Willis is from the Northwest. He lives right around here, in fact, um, in McCleary, Washington. He went to Evergreen. And uh, he was here at the same time as Matt Groening, Linda Berry, and Charles Burns. Like, aren't you envious? This must have been a really exciting place, and it still is. <laughs> um, it, was, it was definitely a hotbed for comics when he was here. Okay, next slide, please. More Steve Willis. The guy was prolific. And uh, he was funny. Michael said that it was one of the few comics where you would read it and laugh out loud. And you know, that's pretty rare for a humor comic where you actually laugh out loud. He would do long stories, stories that went into other stories, um, and just kept drawing and drawing all through the 80s. Next slide, please. Here's one of the comics called Limbo Olympia. Obviously, a, uh, a reference to, to his, his hometown here, or where he was living at the time, Olympia. Um, it features a story, the story of D.B. Cooper, another Northwest figure. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now this is uh, perhaps, these are kind of crummy slides because I shot some of these myself. 
This is, this is maybe Willis's most ambitious work. It's called Tragedy of Morty. It's, uh, made, it was made over three years from 93 to 95 in five thick volumes. It is a fairly faithful adaptation of Hamlet by Shakespeare. And I think it may use the actual complete text of Hamlet. It's really amazing. Um, but it's also goofy. It's Hamlet, a tragedy with goofy cartoon characters. For example, Fred Flintstone is one of the characters. In a, Flintstone appears often in Willis's comics, I think. And, uh, Hanna-Barbera knows nothing about it. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're going to look at Michael Dowers, who is a, an incredible source for this whole lecture. Um, Michael is uh, a publisher. He makes his label as Starhead Comics. It started out as Starhead Mini Comics. This is Starhead Comics number one. And Michael had uh, pretty much the same kind of experience most people I talked to had, and I had, um, of learning about you know, suddenly discovering that there are other comics out there called mini comics that you get by writing to people. And as soon as he saw some mini comics, he immediately wanted to make some himself and like drew and copied and assembled a comic book in a whole weekend. And it was this, this comic, Starhead number one. And I did pretty much the same thing uh, when I first heard about minis, but I think mine was not, not even this good looking. Um, Starhead went for nine issues. And uh, once he, after the ninth issue, he just started publishing as Starhead. Um, he brought higher production values to many comics. Uh, he started doing a lot on Offset, a lot with color. Um, and we see a picture of Michael up there on uh, Fan Scene, which was another review zine, and pretty sharp looking. Uh, that's from 1985. Uh, and then below that, the Greek edition of Morty the Dog. Uh, what else do we got? I keep losing my place, sorry. Testosterone City was a popular Peter Bag mini with a really cool color cover. Uh, Freak Fucks, right here by Dennis Ward. <coughs> Michael, I think, was most proud of anything he's published, that he had published Freak Fucks. And it's a pretty, I looked at some of it, it's pretty funny. Um, production values are first rate, too. It's, it's a really nice, if you, if you ever see a copy of Freak Fucks, buy it, because I think you'll never see one again, and it's, it's worth it at any price. Next slide, please. This is the work of J.R. Williams, who I believe is here today. Let's hear it for J.R. J.R. is from Salem, Oregon. He's a Northwesterner also. You know, many comics are not really based in any one area like New York City or Seattle. Um, they're, they come from everywhere and they actually, being decentralized as part of what they're about because you can live in a small town and be like the only weird person in that town but by sending out your comics you can like learn that there are other people like you out there um, and I, from what I've read it sounds like JR was kind of like the guy in Salem Oregon who had this talent of drawing comics but he didn't really know what to do with it and then he found Jay Kennedy's official Underground and New Wave price guide, which came out in 1982, and it had a like a history of the Underground and New Wave, and it had an ad in the back for Clay Geary's publication. J.R. wrote to Clay and was pretty soon being published by Clay Geary's in his mini comic anthologies. Um, J.R. went on to publish himself and was published by Michael Dowers. I think some of 
most of these are maybe Starhead publications. Uh, and eventually, um, but I didn't know that he had been doing comics this early. These are itchy scaly. They're from, I think, about 1981. And, um, Brad is, is basically an unknown genius. He's an incredible cartoonist, and very few people know of his work. He's done one-pagers for Dirty Plot and uh, Lab. Um, he's, he's really somebody who should have his own comic. If I were a publisher, I would, I would uh, insist the first thing Brad Johnson do his solo comic for me. Uh, but these are, are two of his early mini comics, and uh, this is from Michael Dower's collection, and I was uh, delighted to find them. Next slide, please. Uh, these are comics by somewhat famous artists, show that it's, it's not just weird kids in small towns who are doing mini comics, but some of the world's most famous hip artists. Um, on the left, this kind of hand-drawn, hand-painted cover is by a guy named Le Piz. In the center, we see uh, Raymond Pettibon, that's known for his Sonic Youth album cover, and uh, Black Flag concert posters, etc. So they're really cool, mini. All of these are from Michael Dower's collection, and all of these, he said, you know, this is valuable. Like, you know, I shouldn't touch this. Like, no, no, take it. He's like throwing them in my lap. Oh. It's really fun to go through. Uh, part of the, he pulled out like the cream of his collection for me to look through. Um, Basil Wolverton, another Northwesterner from Vancouver, Washington, did the beautiful guy with pins in his face. Um, Wolverton, I'm sure you all know, is a great artist. I'm not sure what the story is with this comic, um, but it's a mini. Oh, it was printed by Glenn Bray. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the calendar here is by Art Spiegelman, um, who is, I think he probably printed it as part of his Raw Books label. I don't, I don't know the story. But um, just impressed by uh, the kind of people who find their way into doing mini comics. Uh, next slide, please. This is the most bizarre thing in Michael Dower's collection. This is called Comics in a Capsule. It's by Luna Tix, who you might have seen in Weirdo Magazine. It's from 1986. It says, Words by Man Shin. Um, it is, I, I, I did the ruler and the penny like they do on eBay, so you can see. It's, it's a tiny little thing. These are like pill capsules with little pieces of paper rolled into them. It's insane. And on the other side of the label, it says not to be taken internally. Um, Michael Dowers loves this, and he said he's never opened it, never read them, because he doesn't want to ruin it. So they remain kind of a mystery. Um, definitely a, a one-of-a-kind specimen of the art form. Uh, we'll see some more one-of-a-kind specimens later on. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yes, dirty plot. Now we move on to what I call the post-New Wave movement, because there's really no name. It's just after the New Wave died, people started creating mini-comics and doing all kinds of new things with it. Uh, this is Julie Doucet's Dirty Plot Mini from 1989. At the same time she was putting this out, she was starting up a comic for Drawn and Quarterly using a lot of her mini-comic material. Um, you can see there's still a lot of underground influence, but there's also the influence of alternative comics which are starting up uh, throughout the 80s. Uh, zines and fine arts influence you say uh, has gone from minis to being a star of the alternative comics world. 
She was a special guest at the San Diego Comic Con last year, which is pretty cool. Next slide, please. This is The Angry Criminal by Tom Hart. It's a mini comics masterpiece. Um, before Tom did Hutch Owen or The Sands, um, he did this little comic, a digest sized comic in 1991. It's just a guy talking the whole time. And it is fantastic. It's one of the best minis I've ever read. And I hope he gets it on his website soon. Next to it is Houdini. Next, next to it is Houdini, who just did a disappearing trick. Uh, uh, this is an early... Calm down, kids. This is an early Jason Lutz effort, if you can believe it. Um, before he was known for Jar of Fools and Berlin, he was making some really incredible mini-comics with a bunch of his pals from RISD in Rhode Island. Um, this was an anthology that he and Jake Austin and a few other people did stories about Houdini for. And uh, you can kind of tell that they were upping the production quality a little. They did other um, minis with color covers, um, experimented with different formats, minis that came in their own envelopes, etc. Um, these are just examples of, of early 90s minis for artists who moved on to doing published comics. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is where I came in. Uh, in 1991, I discovered mini comics um, the, right as the Gulf War was going on, actually, which was a good time because I was angry and draft age and um, really frustrated with mainstream media. And I discovered comics through Fact Sheet 5, which was a great review zine, um, which still sort of exists. I'm not sure, it's, it's kind of in suspended animation. Um, I made a couple really bad mini-comics, and then I made this Ulysses adaptation, which was about nine pages long, because I had been assigned Ulysses in college and really thought there needed to be a comic book adaptation. This is Molly Bloom having her soliloquy. It was one panel long. Um, it was, uh, I, I made it to be completely accurate, or as accurate as I could, to the novel. And um, mailed it to a few people and didn't know what to do with it. And as a joke, I sent a copy to the Washington Post Book World for review, and they wrote up a few paragraphs on it, which blew my mind, and they also printed my home address and said, you can get copies for a dollar. And I got, like, then a few days later, I got just hundreds, like a, a sack of mail from all these people who read the Washington Post. It was uh, like, the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me. Um, and I, at that point, I said, yeah, I was meant to be a cartoonist. <laughs> and I was led into the false notion that I could make a lot of money by <laughs> selling comics through the mail. And, uh, now you see me as a broken man. <laughs> Next slide, please. These are um, two comics I made the following year or maybe 1993, um, and I put them up here because they are what I published using money from the Zarek Grant. The Zarek Grant was created by Peter Laird, one of the turtle creators. Uh, it started around 1992, and not many people knew about it, which is probably why I got the grant. <laughs> um, now it's really popular, it's a really hotly contested for a grant. Um, and uh, 
everybody has got their eye on who has won the Zara grant this, this round. Um, you get a lot of attention for winning the grant, and you get money. It's the only grant for self-published comics. Um, a lot of people do graphic novels or commercial series type comics, but there are also a lot of cool mini comics that win the Zara grant. Uh, I want to point out this cover, the, the white, yellow, and red one was hand cut. That's not a die cut. Those are hand cut. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide, please. These are two other artists who started in minis and progressed on to doing commercial, uh, commercially published comics. Adrian Tomina's Optic Nerve is one of the mini comic success stories. Um, he had comics published in Pulse magazine and uh, was doing a really sharp mini comic uh, so that Drawn and Quarterly actually approached him and said, hey, we want to publish you. And he said, sure. And as a result, when the, their first issue came out, there was all kinds of hype and expectation, mainly because he had so many fans of his mini comic. James Kochalka uh, started out with a less slick mini comic, um, proclaim, proclaiming himself James Kochalka superstar. Uh, these are both from 1994, I believe. Um, also experimenting with the red and black. I think this was at the time when Xerox shops would do a second color on their machines, some of their machines. Um, James, I read his minis from the start, he started mailing them to me, and the, the earliest ones were really bad. And this one is actually not so bad. It's number four. And the guy has made incredible leaps in his art, and occasionally he, his writing makes a leap too. <laughs> It's always kind of hit or miss. You kind of have to, before you buy the book, kind of look through it. And, is this a good one or a bad one? The guy is super prolific, and um, he is a superstar. He's also a musician, and uh, he's big with the college kids. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, we just saw a cartoonist who went from minis to the big time of published alternative comics. These are two artists who are perfectly happy to produce only mini comics. Um, Jenny Zervakis's Strange Growths, we see issue 12, and then John Porcelino's King Cat number 38, the special Sam issue about his dog Sam, which he made as a tribute when Sam passed away. It's really one of the most moving comics you'll ever read. Both of these artists, I think, have no desire to be commercially published because making a mini-comic is so personal to them, it's, it's almost a personal ritual. Um, it's like a special gift you're making to give the world. Um, John's comics are, he sees them as, as almost like letters he's writing to his friends, um, so that mailing them out and then getting a letter back in response is all part of the comics making process. There's a great interview with him in a recent comics journal that I, I highly recommend. Next slide, please. This is a selection of Northwest mini comic artists. Um, you know, mini comics are not centralized, but there's been tons of great stuff from our area. We see El Mago Sazbo by Mark Campos, who is a Seattle artist. He's with us here today. Look for him. <laughs> Kanja by Jim Woodring, who we heard from earlier. Uh, it's a brilliant jam with um, Mark Martin, um, one of the most beautiful mini comics you'll ever see. The Cat Box Room by Lisa Maslow. Lisa lives in Seattle, though she doesn't. She hasn't drawn comics since she moved to Seattle, but this is a fun 
funny personal comic. Down here we see Boy Trouble and Stevens Comics, both by David Kelly. Boy Trouble is an anthology which he co-edited with Robert Kirby. They're both from 1997. As you can see, Stevens Comics has some lovely production values with the color cover. Um, it's good paper. It's thick stock. Um, it, it looks almost like a commercially published comic. Um, it kind of walks the line. Is it a mini comic? Is it a real comic? It doesn't matter. But I think it's made with a lot of heart, and I think that pushes it more on the mini comic side. It's not, it's not made to make a lot of money or even to break even necessarily. Um, and that's kind of how many comics operate. Um, it's made for the experience of making the comic and getting it out to people. The commercial considerations are really only trying to cover your expenses usually. In other words, you're not going to get rich from this stuff. You do it because you're obsessed. <laughs> Next slide, please. These are two Seattle cartoons. Yes, it's Exotic Tales of Wallingford. It's um, a really great read. It's printed entirely on newsprint. It's thick and it's magazine sized. And it's a long story of a single mom and her dating life. Um, it's kind of thinly veiled autobiography. Uh, I don't know if it's even thinly veiled. <laughs> but it's a great comic. It is... I keep losing my place. It's from 1987. It's by Diane Babbitt. Next to it we see Life After Tintin by Tatiana Gill, who is Diane Babbitt's daughter. This is a kind of passing of the mini comics torch. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, you know, I've been focusing on American and some Canadian comics. Mini comics are an international phenomenon. Um, and I'm only going to give this one slide just to let you know that they happen in other countries too. Hypnagogic Review is by Sasha Rakezic, um, who lives in Serbia. Um, we bombed his country, and um, obviously they've been at war for the past decade um, in a horrific civil war. And uh, his comics, as you can kind of tell from the Tom and Jerry picture, are kind of a reflection of what's going on in his country and how he feels about it. Um, really moving stuff. Um, and really, um, part of reading his comics is writing letters back and forth with him and a really amazing way to find out what's going on in places you hear about in the news. Um, now this comic here, I don't know the title of, but it's from Cambodia. And in Cambodia, it may be a mainstream comic, for all I know, but it looks like a mini comic to me, and it is really weird. I really kind of wish I could read it. But uh, this is a Cambodian comic. Next slide, please. Yes, this is the work from Kanjab of the fantastic Jim Woodring, along with Mark Martin. Um, like I said, you'll never see, you'll, it, it'll, it's rare that you see a mini with this kind of beautiful artwork. Um, Frank, of course, is kind of a Disney-esque character trapped in a bizarre world. Um, Jim Woodring, as he said, made uh, his first Jim comic in 1980, right in the middle of the New Wave thing. Um, and he's continued making minis, you know, even after having a commercial publisher, um, has kept making personal, fantastic minis. One, I believe, is called Page 39. It's a page from his dream journal. 
a really truly awful nightmare. And I used to I used to carry page 39 in my breast pocket of my winter coat so that no matter how depressed I got during a Seattle winter, I could pull that out. And yeah, things could be a lot worse. <laughs> it got me through some rough winters. He also made a mini comic that I drew and Michael Dowers published called Jesus Delivers. And if you, if you see that for sale, you should buy it right away. And there may be copies later. <laughs> um, Jim Woodring's incredible. Let's give him a, a round of applause. huge influence on me, and um, I'm, I'm glad he got sucked into the world of comics. Next slide, please. Ariel Bordeaux. Yeah. A Seattle resident um, who started out doing comics in Boston and then moved to San Francisco and has been in Seattle for the last several years. Um, She's uh, uh, one of the, the leading names in mini comics um, because she, I think, because she talks about uncomfortable things really honestly and with a lot of humor. As you can see from this page, one of my favorite stories by her called Lesbo Hellhole, which is about um, being uh, in a really bad roommate situation. Um, uh, you, you have to read it. <laughs> it's a great story. We're running short on time, so I'm going to go quickly. Next slide, please. This is by Ron Rigi. It's beautiful, as you can see. Ron did minis for a long time before becoming famous, and uh, his secret was he worked at Kinko's. <laughs> I think he sold this for 50 cents or something. Next slide, please. This is some examples of John Porcelino. He's maybe the leading guy in mini comics right now. Um, constantly voted best mini comic in the Comics Journal year after year. Got a very simple, beautiful style. Um, I can't say enough about his comics. They're personal, beautiful, buy them. Um, next slide, please. John also made a review, not a review zine, a catalog called Spit and a Half, um, which was a really important review, um, trading post kind of thing in the 90s. Uh, next slide, please. This is the last Sid Scott story. Um, it is actually a mini-comic attached to a box of red, what are they called? Atomic red hots or something? Atomic fireballs, thank you. Um, and there you see the actual candy from the box. Uh, it's not a very good comic, but it's, <laughs> it's really amazing packaging. Next slide, please. This is a panic attack. It's by someone named Gorgon Radeo. It looks like it might have been from the Fort Thunder guys of Providence, Rhode Island. They make really beautiful um, screen printed minis like this. Um, really crazy Gary Panter influenced art. Um, please seek these guys out. Fort Thunder. Next slide, please. These are some interesting formats. This one is set up like a folded map. Uh, it's by Nick Bertozzi. Recidivist by Zach Sally has a clear plastic cover. Um, Blunderbuss by Stephanie Kulik has the stickers, as you can see. Stephanie was an amazing character. She used to glue a plastic third eye to her forehead and she lived in San Francisco. Very few people ever saw her without her eye on. Um, 
Next slide, please. These are some amazing minis. Um, Ellen Forney hand cut the flower shape on every issue and also hand cut the circle, creating a beautiful effect to a book that later became a Fantagraphics publication. Um, Jason Chiga above made a hand, he hand cut those tabs on the side. That is a choose your own adventure mini comic. It's pretty amazing. In East Timor Funnies, the caption says, actually, it's not that funny, um, came out within days of East Timor being in the news. John Weeks um, got that out very quickly as an informational guide to the situation. Uh, next slide, please. So two pages from Last Cry for Help by Souther Salazar and Dave Kirsch. This was made last year, I think. It's just a crazy, beautiful, artsy mini, and I wanted you all to see this, this cool image. Uh, next slide, please. On the left is White Buffalo Gazette, another, it's, it's a mini anthology edited by Jeff Zenick, who's the coolest guy in mini comics. Um, look for his work if you can find it. This was a hand-printed cover, I believe, uh, Someone named Buzz Buzzizek. The art's by Dave Miller from Scotland, and Buzzizek screened it. It's a gorgeous artifact and a nice comic, too. This is Gloriana, a comic actually called Super Monster by Kevin Hizenga, or Heisinger. Um, it's really thick, it's a great read. It has a fold-out in the center. It's one of the coolest minis I've ever seen. Next slide, please. These are my minis. Um, just to prove that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, the ohm had a hand-cut circle and a hand-pasted picture underneath. Arabiata was um, a hand-pasted picture on Actually, the brown is a grocery bag I've cut and made into the book cover. Um, How to Make Zines and Mini Comics is available here today for just a dollar. Next slide, please. And we come to the end of the talk. I want to thank Michael Dowers, Bruce Christen, and Steve Dennis. Research. Jim Woodring helped also, and Rick Altergott lent me his camera. Thank you very much. <laughs>